Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to talk about hypotension treatment in the outpatient setting in a quiz-like format. I've had numerous students ask me to present on hypertension treatments. I will be making a whole series of videos just like these um, that I've put up. And um, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and please subscribe to my YouTube channel and get more of these educational videos sent to you. Thank you. We're going to begin talking about question one. According to the JNC8 report, at which stage of hypertension should drug therapy be instituted? Your answer should be stage one, uh, answer B. JNC8 recommends patients should be treated with pharmacotherapy at stage one. Stage one hypertension is systolic blood pressures from 140 to 159 and diastolic blood pressures from 90 to 99. The measurements are in millimeters of mercury. Stage 2 hypertension is classified as systolic blood pressure greater than equivalent to 160 and diastolic blood pressures greater than equivalent to 100. There used to be a stage 3, but now they are all lumped up into stage 2. The JNC8 are recommended guidelines for treatment of hypertension. Use clinical judgments. Consider risk and benefits of treatment for each individual when setting goals. In 2014, JNC8 blood pressure goals recommend that patients who are 60 years and older maintain their blood pressure less than 150 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Patients who are less than 60 years of age maintain blood pressure goals less than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Those patients who are less than 60 years of age with chronic kidney disease and who are also diabetic should maintain their blood pressures less than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Therefore, along with continuous lifestyle changes in addition to pharmacotherapy, JNC8 recommends patients who are 60 years or less start pharmacotherapy at 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Patients with diabetes should start pharmacotherapy at 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Patients with chronic kidney disease should start pharmacotherapy at 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Patients who are 60 years of age and older start pharmacotherapy at 150 over 90 millimeters of mercury. We're going to move on to question two. Thiazide diuretics are used to treat hypertension because they deplete body sodium and reduce fluid volume. Diuretics are first-line therapy in the treatment of heart failure and hypertension through their reduction of extracellular fluid volume. Of the several classes of diuretics, the one most commonly used in primary care are the distal tubular, that is your thiazides, and aldosterone antagonists, and then your loop diuretics like Lasix. They inhibit sodium reabsorption in the ascending loop of Henle. The thiazide-like diuretics act on the distal tubule, uh, renal tubule, to inhibit sodium reabsorption. Both of these classes increase potassium excretion. Thiazide-like diuretics are used for initial treatment of many patients with hypertension. Thiazide diuretics are recommended because they have shown 
in randomized controlled trials to reduce morbidity and mortality and because they are less expensive for patients who are often on fixed incomes. Consider using chlorothaladine or indapamide over hydrochlorothiazide due to better evidence of benefit. Most studies have shown outcome benefits of thiazide type diuretic have used chlorothaladine and found it at least as effective as other antihypertensive agents in reducing cardiovascular and renal risk and superior in preventing heart failure. Chlorothaladine is more potent than hydrochlorothiazide and has a longer duration of action, about 24 hours to 72 hours, that persists throughout the nighttime hours and have been shown to be more effective. In one study, um, in patients over the age of 80 years, indapamide with or without the ACE inhibitor, Perindopril, the other name for Perindopril is ASON, um, has shown um, reduction in the um, incidence of death from stroke or any cause. Which patient population benefits the most from diuretic therapy? Your answer should be B, African Americans. According to up to date, hypertension is a major problem in African-American patients. The incidence and prevalence of cardiovascular and renal complications of hypertension are greater than in other race or ethnicity group. The adjusted relative risk of stroke, for example, is more than twice as high in hypertensive African-American patients age 45 to 64 years, as compared with similarly aged hypertensive white patients. The optimal choice of drug or combination of drugs in black patients principally depends upon the presence or absence of comorbid conditions and the specific efficacy of the agent or agents to attain goal blood pressure. Pivotal studies showing clinical benefits of treating hypertension included a thiazide. Thiazides produce better cardiovascular outcomes, including reduced stroke risk than ACE inhibitors in African Americans. African Americans tend, tend to be salt sensitive. This may explain their relatively poor response to ACE inhibitors. So make sure you encourage your patients to uh, restrict sodium. Most African Americans will need at least two antihypertensive to antihypertensives to control blood pressure. Initial antihypertensive therapy usually consists of a single drug or combination of two drugs. If monotherapy is used for African-American hypertensive patients, up-to-date suggest a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, although a thiazide diuretic such as chlorothaladone is a reasonable alternative. The use of these two classes of drugs as initial antihypertensive therapy in black patients is also endorsed by the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association and the European Societies of Hypertension and Cardiology. A 65-year-old woman with a sulfonamide allergy and you would like to recommend a diuretic as an add-on therapy to lower her blood pressure. Which of the following would be an appropriate choice for this patient? Your answer should be A, etocrinic acid. Etocrinic acid can be used for patients allergic to sulfonamides.
Drugs like hydrochlorothiazide, which is a thiazide diuretic um, and loop diuretic like your Lasix, uh, furosemide is the other name, and uh, your bumetanide, which is also um, in the loop diuretic family, have sulfur components in them. Out of the loop diuretics, only etochronic acid does not contain sulfur. Now, in this uh, question, there were no uh, choices uh, that was put uh, for potassium sparing diuretics um, on the list. If potassium sparing diuretics were on one of the choice, I would choose that as an answer also because potassium sparing diuretics does not contain sulfur components. A very common adverse effect of potassium sparing diuretics is hyperkalemia. So also, be very careful when you prescribe these drugs to patients who are on ACE inhibitors because ACE inhibitors are potassium sparing as well and they will raise your potassium levels and the two combination would, well, would be very fatal to the patient. Hypokalemia constitutes a medical emergency primarily due to its effect on the heart. Cardiac arrhythmias associated with hypokalemia include sinus bradycardia, sinus arrest, slow ventricular rhythm, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and asystole. Which of the following disease processes could be made worse by taking a non-selective beta blocker? The answer should be C, both might worsen. That's asthma and diabetes. Non-selective beta blockers like your propanolol, can mask the clinical indicators of hypoglycemia by blocking the sympathetic stimulation caused by low blood sugar level. Therefore, propanolol can be used with caution in patients with diabetes mellitus. In other words, it can suppress tachycardia which is an important warning sign of hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes. Propanolol, the other name is Inderol, is a first-generation non-selective beta blocker that blocks both beta-1 adrenergic receptors in the heart and beta-2 adrenergic receptors in the lungs. Blockade of beta-2 receptors in the skeletal muscle and the liver can inhibit glycogenolysis. This effect can be dangerous for people with diabetes, as discussed previously. Propanolol can be detrimental to diabetic patients in two ways. First, by blocking beta-2 receptors in the muscle and liver, propanolol can suppress glycogenolysis, thereby eliminating an important mechanism for correcting insulin-induced hypoglycemia. Second, by blocking beta-1 receptor, uh, receptors, um, propanolol can suppress tachycardia, tremors, and perspiration, which normally serve as early warning signals that blood glucose levels are falling too low. Normally, when glucose drops below a safe level, the sympathetic nervous system is activated, causing these symptoms. Now, uh, propanolol um, is a non-selective beta blocker, has blocked this sympathetic nervous system. By masking symptoms of hypoglycemia, propanolol can delay awareness of hypoglycemia thereby comp compromising the patient's ability to correct the problem in a timely fashion. Patients with diabetes who take propanolol should be warned that these common symptoms may, may no longer be a reliable indicator of, of hypoglycemia. In addition, 
they should be taught to recognize alternative symptoms that um, blood glucose is falling perilously low. So your symptoms that you should teach them are hunger, uh, fatigue, and poor concentration. Blockade of beta-2 receptors in the lungs can cause bronchoconstriction. As a rule, increased airway resistance is hazardous only to patients with asthma and other obstructive pulmonary disorders. A word about beta blockers in the treatment of hypertension. It is not a first-line treatment for of hypertension. Beta blockers has been shown to be inferior to other first-line agents in patients with uncomplicated hypertension and stroke prevention. No beta blocker is appropriate for initial hypertension therapy except when another indication requires beta blocker use such as heart failure, rate control, MI, or migraine prophylaxis. A pregnant patient who developed hypertension at 28 weeks gestational age, which medication do you anticipate giving? The answer is D, all of the above. Any one of the choices will do. Hypertension is the most common complication of pregnancy, occurring in about 10% of pregnant patients. When drug therapy is initiated during pregnancy, metal dopa is the traditional agent of choice because of its limited effects on the fetus. Metal dopa, a central alpha agonist, is the recommended drug of choice. It has been studied the most and is typically recommended for women whose chronic hypertension is first diagnosed in pregnancy. Methyl dopa is a pregnancy category C drug. Beta blockers like atenolol, labetalol, and metoprolol appears to be safe and effective during the second and third trimesters, but their use in the first trimester has been associated with growth retardation in the fetus. Beta blockers are pregnancy category C. Direct vasodilators such as hydrolyzine is the parental drug of choice based on its long history of safety and efficacy. Hydrolyzine is pregnancy category C. Diuretics are recommended for chronic hypertension if prescribed before gestation or if patient appears to be salt sensitive. They are not recommended in preeclampsia. Patients with pre-existing hypertension typically can continue taking their antihypertensives they previously were prescribed, except for angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors such as captopril, angiotensin-2 receptor blockers such as valsartan, and direct renin inhibitors such as aliscarin. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and direct renin inhibitors are all pregnancy category D, which is positive evidence of fetal risk. These should never be used in, pa in pregnant patients because it may result in fetal abnormalities, including death. In which of the following are ACE inhibitors used in the treatment of hypertension? The answer is all of the above. Recommendations for initial management of hypertension in patients with chronic kidney disease includes ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers. Preferred antihypertensives for patients with diabetes include angiotensin-converting enzyme um, inhibitors such as enalapril, angiotensin receptor blockers, and calcium channel blockers. ACE inhibitors 
are particularly useful because they slow the progression of diabetic nephropathy in addition to lowering blood pressure. Drugs recommended for treatment of hypertension in children 1 to 18 years of age include ACE inhibitors, diuretics, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers. A patient has a new prescription for an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. After you review the patient's current medications list, which of the medications would possibly interact with this new prescription? Answer is D, all of the above. Potassium supplements such as potassium chloride and potassium sparing diuretics like, like spiral nectone can lead to hyperkalemia and should be used with caution. The use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug such as naproxen sodium along with uh, ACE inhibitors may reduce the antihypertensive effects of ACE inhibitors. An ACE inhibitor and what other class of drug may reduce proteinuria in patients with diabetes better than either drug alone? Answer is C, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. ACE inhibitors has been the most effective in patients with diabetic uh, ne uh, nephropathy, proteinuria of 1 gram or more per 24 hours, and renal insufficiency. Calcium channel blockers have also been shown to have some degree of renal protection and are most helpful as part of multi-drug therapy. The non-dihydropyridine um, calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem and verapamil may reduce microalbinuria to an extent uh, comparable with ACE inhibitors. But the dihydropyridine uh, calcium channel blockers such as amlodipine and philodipine may increase it. A 60-year-old female with hypertension is being treated with amlodipine, 10 mg, once daily. She comes for a routine visit. Her blood pressure is 153 over 90 millimeters of mercury and a heart rate of 70 beats per minute. You notice her lower ex um, extremity edema. Which of the following would you recommend for this patient? The answer is C. Add Lysinopril 10 mg daily. This patient has amlodipine induced lower extremity edema, which is a common side effect effects of dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like amlodipine. The other name for it is Norvasc. Because they cause vasodilation, all calcium channel blockers can cause dizziness, headache, and peripheral edema. Amlodipine is administered orally and absorbed slowly. Peak levels develop in 6 to 12 hours. The drug has a long half-life of about 30 to 50 hours and therefore is effective with once a day dosing. Principal adverse effects are peripheral and facial edema. Flushing dizziness, and headache may also occur, as may eczematose a rash in older patients. In contrast to other dihydropyridines, amlodipine causes little reflex tach tachycardia. Amlodipine is available in 12.5 mg, 5 mg, and 10 mg tablets. The usual initial dosage for hypertension or angina pectoris 
is five milligram five milligram once a day. In this question, the sixty-year-old patient and her recent blood pressure of one hundred and fifty-three over ninety millimeters of mercury, despite being on a calcium channel blocker, amlodipine ten milligram a day at its maximum dose. According to JNC eight. Blood pressures for patients who are sixty years and older should maintain their blood pressure less than one hundred and fifty over ninety millimeters of mercury. So, if you look at the choices, you will actually not decrease her dose to five milligram of amlodipine because it's not really working. Uh, if her blood pressure is in the one hundred and fifties. Okay, so and discontinuing her medication that will not help. Also, edema is common in patients undergoing treatment for hypertension, with several possible etiologies that may commonly coexist. Many patients with hypertension present with salt sensitive, that predisposes them to mild hypovolemia, and Or hypervolemia and edema. Hypertension is a risk factor for many comorbidities that can include edema, including chronic kidney disease, heart failure, and renal insufficiency. These should be considered before assuming that edema is medication induced. Nevertheless. Edema is the most common adverse effect in patients taking dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, because calcium channel blockers have intrinsic mild natriuretic properties. This effect is not related to overall salt and water retention. Rather, the primary mechanism seems to be arteriolar. Dilation without co-committant vasodilation, the increased venous pressure, venous pressure, can lead lead to a capillary leak and increased in, interstitial fluid. Unless the edema is multifactorial, adding a diuretic usually does not provide significant relief. So you may not want to add Lasix to her medication regimen. Women may be particularly susceptible to calcium channel blocker induced edema. Peripheral edema can be minimized by decreasing the dose, but in this question, the patient may not benefit from decreasing her blood pressure medication. She could try to、um, elevate her legs,、uh, wear compression stockings, and、uh, or change to a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamil or、um, diltiazem.、Uh, that would be another option. Or using calcium channel blockers in combination with venodilating agents such as ACE inhibitors. So why choose an ACE inhibitor to combine with the calcium channel blocker? Okay, ACE inhibitors dilates blood vessels and reduce blood volume. Both actions help lower blood pressure. It does this by reducing angiotensin II in your circulation. So what is this angiotensin II? It is a vasoconstrictor that is released in your body. This hormone works on the kidneys to retain fluid and salt and increase blood volume, and thereby increasing blood pressure. ACE inhibitors are used against angiotensin II to produce the opposite effects. In other words, by causing venous dilation, ACE inhibitors reduce. Pulmonary congestion and peripheral edema. By dilating blood vessels in the kidneys, they increase renal blood flow 
and thereby promote excretion of sodium and water. This loss of fluid has two beneficial effects. First, it helps reduce edema. Second, by lowering blood volume, it decreases venous return to the heart and thereby reducing right heart workload. This is a great drug for heart failure, MI, diabetic, and non-diabetic nephropathy. ACE inhibitors are particularly useful because they slow the progression of diabetic nephropathy in addition to lowering blood pressure. In fact, the JNC8 recommends that first line uh, antihypertensives used in patients with diabetes are either ACE inhibitors or an angiotensin receptor blocker or calcium channel blocker or thiazides in non-black diabetic patients. For chronic kidney disease regimen, um, they should use uh, ACE inhibitor or uh, ARBs. This is uh, included um, also with um, African-American patients. For African-American patients with diabetes, their regimen should include thiazide or calcium channel blocker. When treating patients with hypertension, drug treatment costs are important. Which of the, uh, these choices are not true regarding costs? Your answer should be D. Few antihypertensive drugs come in generic formulation. The cost of antihypertensive drug therapy should be considered in drug selection, especially for patients who require multiple drugs. In some cases, generic formulations are acceptable and cheaper than brand name counterparts. Non-generic agents are usually more expensive. If the branded agent is equally effective and there are no compelling reasons for its use, cost may be a major factor in choosing the initial therapy. If the branded agent is more effective or there is a compelling reason for its use, cost should be secondary consideration. Using combinations can also reduce drug costs. Some examples of combination drug therapy to treat hypertension are ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers like enalapril and uh, in a combination of philodopine with this five milligram and five milligram and a name brand is um uh, uh, lexazole and the other combination is lysinopril and hydrochlorothiazide the lysinopril is an ace inhibitor and uh, hydrochlorothiazide is a th uh, is a um, diuretic um, is a thiazide diure diuretic and the combination, it can come in um, 10 milligram of lysinopril and 12.5 milligram of hydrochlorothiazide. Or you can have 20 of lysinopril and uh, 12.5 of hydrochlorothiazide. And then the other uh, amount that you can have, the dosage is 20 uh, of uh, lysinopril and 25 of hydrochlorothiazide. And the brand name is zesteretic and then you have have another combination which is a brand name called Hyzar. Hyzar uh, consists of the angiotensin receptor blocker lorsartan potassium and uh, your diuretic your thiazide um, is the hydrochlorothiazide and it could come in um, lorsartan can come in 50 and the uh, thiazide can um, come in 12.5 milligram or lorsartan 100 and then uh, the hydrochlorothiazide is um, 25 milligram okay. and then other, the other combination is uh, lopressa HCT which is the beta blocker and a diuretic so again you have metoprolol 
and then you have the hydrochlorothiazide and the uh, amount is um, the dosage is 10 milligram of uh, metoprolol and 25 milligram of hydrochlorothiazide or 100 uh, milligram of metoprolol and um, 25 milligram of hydrochlorothiazide. And then you have the diuretic to di uh, and diuretic combo, which is the spironectone and hydrochlorothiazide. So you can have um, 25 um, of spironectone and 25 of hydrochlorothiazide or 50-50, and the brand name is aldactone. Caffeine, exercise, and smoking should be avoided for at least how long? before blood pressure measurement? Answer is B, 30 minutes. The most important monitoring parameter is blood pressure measurement. Equipment used to monitor blood pressure should be regularly inspected and validated. The operator should be trained and regularly retrained in the appropriate technique and the proper patient positioning. Caffeine Exercise and smoking should be avoided for at least 30 minutes prior to measurement. The person should be seated in a chair, not on the examination table, for at least 5 minutes with feet on the floor and arms supported at heart level. At a, an appropriately sized cuff. Cuff bladder encircling at least 80% of the arm should be used. At least two measurements are taken and the average recorded. The healthcare provider should provide uh, to patients verbally and in writing their specific blood pressure numbers and the blood pressure goal of their treatment. Home and clinic blood pressure measurement in the early morning before the patient has taken the antihypertensive drug or drugs provides data about the adequacy of uh, management related to the increase in blood uh, pressure after rising. Measurement in the late afternoon or evening helps to uh, monitor control across the day. Because the stress of a clinic visit may result in higher blood pressure readings in the clinic, blood pressure goals based on home monitoring are usually lower than those based on uh, clinic, uh, clinic monitoring. Less than optimal blood pressure readings should not lead to assumption that blood pressure therapy is ineffective. Some cases can be traced to non-adherence to the plan. Uncovering barriers to treatment is part of monitoring. Um, telemonitoring has been shown to improve patient outcomes. Blood pressure checks in children. Your answer should be C. Should be done during every health care visit after age 3. Measure blood pressure at each encounter for children greater than equivalent to three years of age who have obesity, renal disease, history of aortic arch obstruction or coordication, diabetes, or are taking medications known to raise blood pressure. Hypertension should be diagnosed in children and adolescents who have oscillatory uh, confirm, co confirmed blood pressure readings greater than 95 percentile based on sex, age, and height tables in three different visits. Children and adolescents who have been diagnosed with hypertension should be counseled regarding lifestyle modification, including diet and physical activity. Children and adolescents who fail lifestyle modification should be prescribed pharmacologic therapy. Treatment options may include an ACE inhibitor, ARB inhibitor, long-acting calcium channel blocker, or thiazide diuretic. 
treatment goals for children and adolescents who have been diagnosed with hypertension should be a reduction in blood pressure to less than 90th percentile and less than 130 over 80 millimeters of mercury in adolescents age 13 years and older. Evaluation of hypertensive children, you assess for additional risk factors, follow up blood pressure, if normal, could be repeated in one year. If pre-hypertensive, repeat blood pressure in six months. If the patient has stage one, repeat in two weeks. If symptomatic or stage two, refer or, or repeat in one week. Indications for antihypertensive drug therapy in children, symptomatic hypertension, secondary hypertension, target organ damage, diabetes, persistent hypertension despite non-pharmacologic measures. In children aged less than three years, conditions that warrant blood pressure measurement include prematurity, very low birth weight, or neonatal complications, congenital heart disease, recurrent urinary tract infections, hematuria, or proteinuria, renal disease, or urologic malformations, familial hypercholesterolemia of congenital renal disease, solid organ transplant, malignancy or bone marrow transplant, drugs known to raise blood pressure, systemic illnesses, increased intracranial pressure. Lack of adherence to blood pressure management is very common. Reasons for this lack of adherence include D, all of the above. Lack of adherence to a therapeutic regimen to control blood pressure, unfortunately, is very common. Several factors in hypertension management foster this non-adherence. It is hoped that a less stringent, acceptable blood pressure range for adults with average risk will improve adherence statistics. Lifestyle modification is a foundation of hypertension management and difficulty in achieving and maintaining lifestyle changes is well documented. Adverse drug reactions and drug costs are also factors in non-adherence. Sexual dysfunction, fatigue, and Depression are common adverse reactions to several classes of antihypertensive drugs. A systemic team approach that uses health professionals and community resources can assist in providing the necessary education, support, and follow-up improve adherence. The ultimate improvement in adherence is related to the patients having a positive experience with and trust in their healthcare provider. Better communication improves outcomes and empathy builds trust. Lifestyle modifications for patients with prehypertension or hypertension include C. Adopt a DASH diet. Studies have shown that we can reduce blood pressure by adopting a healthy diet known as the dietary approaches to stop hypertension eating plan. This diet is rich in fruits, vegetables, and low fat dairy products and low in total fat, saturated fats, and cholesterol. In addition, the plan encourages Intake of whole grain products, fish, poultry, and nuts, and recommends a minimal intake of red meat and sweets. Details are available online at 
H um, NHLBI dot NIH dot gov slash health slash health dash topics slash topics slash dash backslash. In order to reduce blood pressure, two types of treatment may be used drug therapy and lifestyle modification, such as smoking cessation, reduction of salt, and, al and reduction of alcohol intake, following the DASH diet, and increasing aerobic exercise. This concludes my video on hypertension treatment in an outpatient center uh, in a question and answer format. I will be making more videos just like these, so stay tuned and please subscribe. And thank you very much for watching, and have a great day.